Hey everyone, it's Sarah's Registered Nurse RN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be covering the antibiotic group known as cephalosporins. So let's get started. Cephalosporins are a large group of beta lactam antibiotics that can be used to treat gram positive and gram negative bacterial infections. Now, cephalosporins are related to another group of beta lactam antibiotics known as the penicillins. And the reason that they're related is because they have a similar chemical structure. They both contain this beta lactam ring. So because of this, there is a cross sensitivity risk for your patient if they're allergic to penicillin because patients who are allergic to penicillin can potentially be allergic to cephalosporins, especially those older generations of cephalosporins. So as a nurse, you want to make sure that you're aware of this cross sensitivity risk and that you really assess your patient's medication allergies. And if they tell you that they're allergic to penicillin, investigate that a little bit. See what type of reaction that they had to penicillin and if it was really a true hypersensitivity reaction, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. Now, what medications are considered a cephalosporin and how do you expect to administer them as a nurse? Well, typically they are administered parenterally, so IM or IV, or orally. And whenever you're trying to recognize them on a patient's medication list, it's fairly easy because since we're dealing with cephalosporins, which that word starts with CE, Majority of those generic names are also going to have CE at the beginning of them. And you'll either see CEPH, like CEF, or CEPH, C-E-P-H-A-L. For example, here are some first generation cephalosporins. We have cefazolin and we have cephalexin. So see that CE, the CEF, or CEPH. That tells me, hey, I'm dealing with a cephalosporin. So one thing you wanna remember about cephalosporins is that they can be divided into generations. And so far, there are five generations of cephalosporins. And depending on the generation, they will target different types of bacteria. For example, the older generations of cephalosporins, they have a narrow reach, so they don't target as much bacteria compared to the newer generations where they can really have a broad reach and they tackle some serious bacterial infections. So let's take a look at these five generations and talk about what they target. So first up is the first generation of cephalosporins, and this generation mainly targets gram-positive cocci like staphylococci and streptococci. Now it can target a few gram-negative bacteria like Klebsiella pneumoniae and E. coli. And some medications included in this generation include cefazolin, and cephalexin. Next is a second generation of cephalosporins. And this generation can target what the first generation did, but it expands coverage to include some more gram negative, such as Haemophilus influenzae and Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Now, one thing about this generation is that it can also target some gram negative anaerobes, such as Bacteroides fragilis. Now there's two particular medications in this generation that can do that, and it's cefoxetin and cefotetan. And a few other medications include in the second generation include cefalchlor and cefuroxine. Next up is the third generation of cephalosporins. Now this generation goes after even more gram-negative bacteria like Proteus and some gram-positive, but it does not have as much reach as that first and second generation. And a few medications included in this generation include cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, and what you want to remember about this medication is that you don't want to administer it with calcium solutions because it could cause calcium precipitation. And then another one is ceftazidime. And this medication is the only one in the group that actually targets Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Then we have the fourth generation, and this generation has a wide target. It can target both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and it has even better coverage for pseudomonal infections. And a medication included in this generation is like cefepime. And then lastly, the fifth generation. This generation can target gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, and is actually the only cephalosporin generation that can take on MRSA. And one medication that is a fifth generation cephalosporin is called ceftaroline. Now let's talk about how cephalosporins work to treat bacterial infections. So overall, cephalosporins have a bacterial cytal effect on bacteria, meaning that they kill them. And how they do this is that they inhibit cell wall synthesis. So within the cell wall, you have a very important protective layer that is really responsible for keeping that bacteria strong and firm and being able to withstand certain pressures within the cell. And that layer is known as peptidoglycan. 
So depending on if we're talking about a gram positive or gram negative bacteria, this thickness of this layer can really vary. In gram positive bacteria, that peptidoglycan layer is extremely thick. Whereas on gram negative bacteria, they have an outer membrane and then you have a thinner peptidoglycan layer. So regardless of the thickness of this layer, this layer is very important because it provides a very strong protective shell in a sense for that bacteria and it also helps that cell withstand the intense osmotic pressure that is occurring within it. Therefore, if we can affect how this peptidoglycan layer is synthesized, hence created, we can cause this cell to lose its strong protective layer and we can cause this cell to be affected by that intense osmotic pressure that's within the cell, causing it to rupture and die. And that's exactly what we want to happen because we wanna kill this bacteria that's affecting the patient. So now let's talk about how this layer is hence created, synthesized, and then talk about how cephalosporins affect this synthesis. So peptidoglycan is a polymer and it is made up of a network of polysaccharide strands and amino acids. So if we took this layer and we blew it up, we could see exactly what it is made up of. You would see in acetylmeramic acid, which is known as NAM, and then right beside of it, its best friend, you would see in acetyl glucosamine, which is known as NAG. And they love to hang out really close to each other. They form these strands and then these strands can stack on top of each other. Now, in order to be really tightly close knit together, they have to be cross-linked. So this is a very important process for this whole layer. In order for this layer to survive and work, it has to be properly cross-linked together. So coming off, particularly NAM, are several amino acids and penicillin binding proteins go and help cross-link all these together so we can get this nice tight bond. So there's several types of penicillin binding proteins, particularly we're talking about like transpeptase enzymes that help this process happen. Therefore, if this cross-linking process doesn't happen properly, we get a faulty peptoglycan layer that can't withstand intense osmotic pressure, which is exactly what we want. So what happens with a cephalosporin, as we've talked about earlier, it has a beta-lactam ring. This beta-lactam ring is going to go and bind with this penicillin binding protein, hence affecting how this cross-linking process happens. And whenever we have a bad cross-linking process, we're gonna have a cell wall that is no longer strong and protective, and it cannot withstand this intense osmotic pressure within the cell wall, hence it ruptures and dies, and we have dead bacteria. So now let's talk about our role as a nurse whenever we're administering these antibiotics. So before we even give the antibiotics, we need to make sure our patient is not allergic to them, and then just check and make sure that they're not allergic to penicillin as well, because remember, there's a cross-sensitivity risk with these medications. In addition, while your patient's taking them, make sure that they're aware of those important education points and that they're actually getting better. Is this actually treating their infection? And then you want to monitor for those adverse reactions that can happen with this antibiotic group. So to help us remember all those concepts, let's remember the first part of cephalosporins, the cephala. So C is for creatinine and BUN labs to monitor. These labs help us assess kidney function and cephalosporins can be nephrotoxic, particularly if the patient's having a high dose of these medications, or let's say that they have some renal insufficiency going on already. They're definitely at risk for this. So as a nurse, you wanna make sure you monitor their intake and their output. And in adults, make sure that they're putting out at least 30 mLs of urine per hour. That helps us know that hey, our kidneys are working and they're producing urine. E is for alcohol intolerance and ETOH is actually a medical abbreviation used to represent ethanol alcohol. So this alcohol intolerance can also sometimes be called a disulfiram like reaction and it gets its name from disulfiram which is actually a medication that can be prescribed to treat alcohol addiction. Its trade name is antabuse and whenever a patient takes antabuse it will cause them to become intolerant to alcohol after they drink 
drink it. Now, unfortunately, if a patient drinks alcohol or takes medications with it in it, it can actually lead to signs and symptoms of intolerance that would be similar to this medication whenever they're taking some types of cephalosporins. So you want to educate your patient that they don't want to drink alcohol or take any medications with alcohol in it because it can happen up to three days after their last dose of this antibiotic. And the signs and symptoms that can be experienced are quite unpleasant. They can experience vomiting, nausea, flushing, sweating, headache, and dizziness. P is for pseudomembranous colitis. And this is a major infection and inflammation of that large intestine that is caused by a C. diff infection. Now you may also see it called antibiotic associated colitis. It can be caused by other types of antibiotics such as the fluoroquinolones, which we discussed earlier. Now how you monitor for this as a nurse is you assess your patient's stool pattern. So make sure the patient's not having severe watery stool along with a fever, abdominal cramps, and an elevated white blood cell count, which is known as leukocytosis. And if they are having these things, you want to notify the physician who could order a stool test for you to collect the stool and send it off for a C. diff test. Now as a side note, sometimes these medications do cause GI upset in patients where they'll have vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea. And administering oral medications with food may help decrease this. But if your patient's having those signs and symptoms of the severe watery stool, they're having fever, cramps, white blood cell count, that is not normal and you definitely want to report it. And then H is for hypersensitivity reactions. So you wanna make sure you monitor your patient for any intense itching, any skin, rashes that are very red and noticeable, something similar here, or in worst case scenarios, they're starting to have anaphylaxis where they're having facial swelling, they can't breathe. And if this happens, of course, you want to discontinue the medication and notify the physician immediately for further orders. A is for administering IV. You want to watch out for thrombophlebitis, which will present as redness, pain, and swelling at the IV site. And then if you're administering them IM through the intramuscular route, you want to be aware that they can cause severe pain and redness at the site. So you want to use a very large muscle for giving these antibiotics IM. And then lastly, L, which is lowers prothrombin, which is known as hypoprothrombinemia, which will increase the patient's risk for bleedings. Because what can happen happen is it affects vitamin K's role in clotting, which helps with the creation of prothrombin. So you would monitor that PTI and R level, and then just look at your patient, make sure they're not having any unusual bleeding or bruising. Okay, so that wraps up this review over cephalosporins. And if you'd like to watch more videos in this series, you can access the link in the YouTube description below.